Major breaking news, I received a press release from the California Rifle and Pistol Association indicating that they are going to petition the United States Supreme Court to stop the stay of Judge Benitez's ruling in the quote-unquote large capacity magazine ban case known as Duncan versus Bonta. Let's talk about whether or not this is a good idea and also if it moves forward, what arguments should be made. Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. And as I've said before, apparently, the book should also be What the Ukraine War Teaches the Israelis About the Right to Bear Arms in Light of the Recent Attacks in Israel. All right, folks, so I received a press release uh, uh, just a little bit ago from the California Rifle and Pistol Association, a very strong organization out there run by several excellent lawyers, uh, many of whom I follow on uh, Twitter or X, uh, run, of course, by the uh, famous lawyer in California, Chuck Michel. And uh, it indicates, at least according to the Ray Line, breaking California Rifle and Pistol Association to petition SCOTUS to take up Duncan versus Bonta. Uh, as you know, Duncan v. Bonta is the magazine case dealing with uh, California's ban on magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. Judge Roger Benitez rightly concluded that it was unconstitutional, which is clearly the right answer. And after a series of procedural shenanigans, as I see it, by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, an en banc, that's right, an 11-judge en banc grouping of the Ninth Circuit judges got together, and not all of them, uh, but in a 7-4 to four decision concluded that Judge Benitez's decision was likely wrong in an absurd, crappy opinion by the Ninth Circuit that was frankly embarrassing, and I would give a B-plus at best, uh, and that would be very generous to a law student of mine, uh, never mind a, a court of appeals judge in California. Nevertheless, a really poorly reasoned, uh, weak tea, weak sister kind of uh, opinion by the Ninth Circuit concluding that Judge Roger Benitez was wrong. Uh, no way, no how did their rationale any, in any respect overcome the powerful reasoning of Judge Benitez's 72-page opinion, even though there were some flaws in Judge Benitez's decision, uh, but they were not material to the out ultimate outcome. We've talked about that in prior videos. Nevertheless, the Ninth Circuit obviously got it wrong, in my view. There was a four-judge dissent. Um, and what happens next? Well, the California Rifle and Pistol Association, who's been taking the, who's been handling this case, has indicated, at least according to their email that I received uh, in the form of a press release, that they intend to petition the Supreme Court to ask the Supreme Court to take a look at this case and to tell the Ninth Circuit uh, no can do and to reinstate Judge Benitez's uh, ruling um, that says the magazine ban is unconstitutional. Now, while I applaud this notion and applaud aggressiveness as a general matter. And certainly, uh, if we were speaking in Plato's cave, if we're trying to seek platonic truth, if you will, there's no doubt that Judge Benitez is correct, and the 7-4 to four decision by the Ninth Circuit on bond panel is clearly wrong under the law, under the text of the Constitution, under the historical methodology, and under Heller, and even under Bruin, for that matter. Nevertheless, the question is, should this uh, petition or this request to the Supreme Court be made? Uh, frankly... I'm inclined to suggest that this not be made because I think it is almost certainly going to fail. Um, this is just my opinion. And I say that not because of what truth is, but because of the context of where this is right now. If you recall, several months ago, we were talking about cases out of Chicago, Cook County, Illinois, as well as the state of Illinois. There were a series of lawsuits involving both the magazine ban in Illinois as well as the quote-unquote assault weapon ban, which is a sort of simply a, a semi-automatic uh, rifle ban in Illinois. There was a series of cases brought, split decision by the district courts, finding some that it violated the Constitution, some that said it did not. Nevertheless, it went up to the Seventh Circuit. The Seventh Circuit immediately stayed a decision to enjoin the Illinois law by a Southern District of Illinois judge. And, of course, uh, Judge Frank Easterbrook, who is absolutely horrific on the Second Amendment, we've talked about him before, uh, decided to uh, enjoin, if you will, or to stay the lower court's decision that the Illinois uh, law was unconstitutional. There was an emergency stay sought, or I should say an emergency petition filed to the U.S. Supreme Court. That was filed by the law firm of Paul Clement and Aaron Murphy, two very high-end uh, 
fancy Second Amendment lawyers, both of whom I believe clerk for the United States Supreme Court. Paul Clement was the former Solicitor General of the United States. He's also the lawyer that argued in front of the Supreme Court, uh, Bruin, as well as uh, McDonald, and so on. So he's very familiar to the U.S. Supreme Court. They know him well, and they know him personally. Uh, nevertheless, the application to try to reinstate the district court decision, even though it was very powerful by Paul Clement and Aaron Murphy, his partner, uh, his law partner at least, they uh, the Supreme Court denied that application. Now, part of the reason why that was denied was that the Seventh Circuit in the interim period while the application was pending decided to expedite the appeal uh, and hear the argument ASAP in the next hearing. And I think as a result of that, it kind of mooted out or eliminated the urgency in the view of the Supreme Court, and they simply denied uh, the application to stop or reverse the stay of the Seventh Circuit, which the stay, of course, in the Seventh Circuit prevented the injunction of the Illinois law from taking effect, which is unfortunate. Now, the reason why I remind you of that context is that the California Rifle and Pistol Association, uh, Association if they seek a petition to the U.S. Supreme Court in Duncan versus Monta, while I applaud the uh, notion of it, uh, I'm really skeptical that it will succeed because the Supreme Court's going to be aware, aware that in a very similar position, they deny the application for an emergency reversal of a, of a stay of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals just a few months ago. And I'm not quite sure why they will see this differently. There are some technical reasons why the Ninth Circuit case is different than the Seventh Circuit case. For example, uh, the Ninth Circuit, I believe, has scheduled oral argument for some time, many, many, many months from now, which is much different than what Frank Easterbrook did in the Seventh Circuit, which is he expedited the argument of the decisions involving the magazine and the assault weapon ban, quote unquote, assault weapon bans in Illinois. So that is one distinction. Uh, the other thing is there's no doubt that the shenanigans that the Ninth Circuit en banc panel played uh, with how they circumvented all sorts of things to claim that this case was a comeback case under the federal rules uh, could possibly be a procedural problem. And there's some very argument, quirky arguments involving a federal statute dealing with court's jurisdiction under 18 U.S.C. Section 46, uh, which I'm not going to really get into in this video, but maybe in a separate video we can talk about the meaning of it, because I think that statute arguably is a little bit ambiguous as to what the Ninth Circuit en banc panel did. So I'm not sure it's a slam dunk winner uh, on an application on an emergency basis to try to get the Ninth Circuit stay order to be vacated by the U.S. Supreme Court. I think that will be a stretch. And I don't really like, as a general matter, I'm not saying always, but as a general matter, if I feel highly, it's highly likely that I'm going to lose a motion or I'm going to lose an argument or I'm going to lose something uh, with respect to the Second Amendment, my general preference is not to do it. Uh, there are exceptions to what I'm about to say, but generally speaking, I don't like to create precedents where Second Amendment cases lose, and I certainly don't like to go to the U.S. Supreme Court where I think I'm likely to lose, uh, because when I lose, it allows the anti-gunners to do a bunch of press releases and cite to the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court had another opportunity to speak to the Second Amendment, even on an emergency basis, and rejected it, right? It just doesn't look good. The optics are wrong. So I don't generally like it. And I think the California Rifle and Pistol Association, while a great organization, uh, if they do indeed seek such an emergency application to the U.S. Supreme Court, I think it is a Hail Mary kind of thing. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible or frivolous at all. I'm just saying I think it's a little bit of a Hail Mary pass. And uh, I generally don't like to do that unless there's no alternative or other st or there's another strategic reason for doing it. And I'm not sure there I can see one here. Nevertheless, if, if the motion is made, uh, I think the argument will be very straightforward. That's the good news. It's not a particularly difficult argument. Obviously, the first argument is that this is a straightforward case under the U.S. Supreme Court precedent of Heller, because Heller talks about arms ban cases, as you know, and it really laid out what is now known as the Bruin methodology, which is start you the text first. Uh, then assuming that the text is implicated by the gun control law, which a ban on magazines holding more than 10 rounds obviously implicates the text of the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, once that's implicated, the burden shifts to the government. Now, again, under Heller, the burden shifts to the government to show um, really that the ban of what you're, or the object you're trying to ban is somehow at a minimum not in common use. And that is simply an impossible burden for the government to show when it comes to semi-automatic pistols, uh, AR-15s, uh, AK-47 semi-automatics, 
uh, or of course magazines that hold more ten, than, than ten, more than ten rounds in America. Uh, remember, it's a national standard because the Second Amendment is a national right. So you don't look at like number of magazines held like in New York City or Manhattan. You look nationwide, and there's no doubt that there's literally millions, if not tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of magazines that hold uh, more than ten rounds. I think I probably personally, I don't even know how many I have, but uh, uh, it's a it's a huge number uh, floating around of, of, of these, both for handguns and also for long guns. I'm sure most people watching this have these. These are ubiquitous. Um, they're everywhere. Uh, these magazines hold more than 10 rounds. So there's no doubt they're in common use. But again, the burden is on the government to show they're not in common use because ultimately the government has the burden to show that these are dangerous and unusual. But they can never meet the unusual standard uh, when they deal with these kinds of weapons because, again, they're in common use, which is what the Supreme Court said in Heller. And nothing in Bruin said that alter that in any respect whatsoever because, remember, Bruin reaffirmed Heller and explained that basically Heller did everything right and Bruin was really doing the Heller analysis and Heller laid out the test for gun ban cases and Bruin laid out the test for discretionary licensing regimes and ultimately the methodology of interpreting the Second Amendment is exactly the same. The anti-gunners want to ignore Heller because it's very, 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 very bad for them. So they pretend that it's not good law, but that is clearly a lie. It's fake news 1000% because Bruin cited favorably Heller literally something like 80 times and there's nothing in the Bruin decision that in any way, shape, or form suggests that Heller got cut back. And remember, when the U.S. Supreme Court wants to cut back on a decision, they make it very clear. Just take a look at the Dobbs decision that says unequivocally that the decision in Roe v. Wade is superseded and reversed and vacated and bye-bye for all times. So when they want to get rid of a precedent, they make it very clear. Obviously, Bruin affirmed and loved and, and spoke highly of the Heller decision, reaffirming it is still the law of the land. So that's all very easy because these magazines are indeed in common use. Nor is there any kind of a real serious argument that can pass the smell test that these magazines are not arms. Remember the text of the Second Amendment, right? It's the right of the people to keep and bear arms. So we turn our attention to what is an arm. This is not a heavy lift, folks. As you know, you go back to the Heller decision. It defines what is an arm. It uses, I think, three separate uh, founding era dictionaries. It uses, of course, Samuel Johnson, who was a famous English lexicographer. I think he was at Oxford. We like Oxford here at the Four Box of Diner for obvious reasons. Uh, nevertheless, we go back to Samuel Johnson at the time of the founding English lexicographer, which means he's a guy that compiles dictionaries, and he defines arms as anything that can be used offensively or defensively, including body armor. You also, I think there's a citation of Noah Webster, who was the first American lexicographer of American English. That's Noah Webster. Samuel Johnson talked about arms in the context of English, English. Noah Webster in the context of uh, American English, because he wanted to have an American dictionary of English. He didn't like the English so much. So of course, that makes sense. But it doesn't matter, no matter how you look at it at the time of the founding or around the time of the founding, arms or anything that can be used offensively or defensively, that obviously would include magazines that do various things with guns. Because again, what makes a modern firearm, which we know is in common use and protected, according to Heller, is that you can fire multiple rounds without having to reload. That, of course, makes it a modern thing. Also, these magazines are essential components of modern day firearms. Um, so the Supreme Court precedent is clear that where something is an essential component of a right, it is obviously protected. A lot of this stuff that can be implied, uh, implicit, Keep in mind, for example, the, the, there's no right, uh, if you look at the text of the First Amendment, which is the right to free speech or the right to freedom of the press, there's no specific reference to ink, there's no specific reference to pens, there's no specific references to paper, there's no specific references uh, to pencils, there's no specific references to computers, to internet, to emails, to phones, to television, to radios, or any of that stuff. Nevertheless, all those things are viewed by the Supreme Court as implied and part of the right, to, uh, in that case, the right of free press or the right of free speech. And in the same way, magazines may not be specifically mentioned in the Second Amendment's right to keep their arms, but neither is ammunition, neither are barrels, neither is a firing pin, neither is a pistol grip. None of these things are specifically expressly mentioned in the text of the Second Amendment, but they, of course, are understood to be protected by the text of the Second Amendment for obvious reasons. Beyond that, there is language in the Bruin decision that says that anything, anything at all that facilitates, facilitates self-defense is a protected arm. And of course, an argument that I've made, I may have even made this up because I'm not sure anybody else has made this, although I've encouraged people to make it in their briefs. Hopefully they have done so. Uh, the point is, remember, Heller is an arms ban case, specifically a firearm case, a firearm ban case, because the District of Columbia and Heller in 2008 said that handguns were banned in the District of Columbia. 
Okay? Now, pause for a moment and reflect on what I'm about to say. The ban on magazines that hold more than 10 rounds in California and elsewhere, they are in fact a gun ban case. They are in fact not just an arms ban case, they're actually a firearms ban case. Okay? Why do I say that? Because the magazines being banned are those that hold more than 10 rounds. As a consequence, California has effectively, with that law, banned an entire category, an entire class of firearms specifically. That class or that category of firearms that has been banned by California are those firearms that are able to fire more than 10 rounds without having to manually reload the gun. So an entire category of firearms has effectively been banned by these laws. So in addition, so even if you assume for the argument, for, you want to assume, assume arguendo for the sake of the argument that these magazines are not arms, which they clearly are, and no one would disagree really if you're honest. But even if you assume that's the case, it doesn't matter for the outcome because it's these, these effectively have the uh, effect of banning a category of firearms. And of course, as we know from Heller specifically, you cannot ban a category of arms, including firearms, um, that are in common use for obvious reasons under the Second Amendment. And because guns that hold more than 10 rounds that can, without having to be reload uh, are ubiquitous in the United States, in common use times a thousand, uh, obviously they cannot be banned in California. So it's a very straightforward argument by the California Rifle and Pistol Association. And of course, as you know, nothing about Bruin disturbs Heller. So bottom line is this sh should, in Plato's cave, in a perfect world, be a slam dunk case as Judge Benitez basically got it right despite a few uh, you know, things I would have cleaned up in his opinion. But the bottom line is, <clears throat> I do not see the Supreme Court on an interlocutory basis. As you know, this is interlocutory. The Supreme Court generally likes to hear cases and decide them after a final judgment when all the litigation down below has been heard. Because this is an interlocutory appeal where the full-blown Ninth Circuit has not issued a final ruling on an appeal, it's not a final judgment in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. As a result of that, you know, the Supreme Court is unlikely to want to get involved in this case because it's just not what they do Mo almost always. They don't like to hear things on an interlocutory basis. It's not their preference. They prefer for a final litigation, a final judgment in all respects to be had. And because this is matter is still pending in the Ninth Circuit, I think it's highly unlikely they're going to get involved. And that's especially true since they refused to get involved with the Seventh Circuit assault weapon and magazine cases just several years, just several months ago. So I think it's a long shot. Unfortunately, so I'm not happy about it. I'm just telling you what I think is going to happen. I think it's a long shot for the Duncan versus Bonta case uh, to get a different result. And I think the Supreme Court's just going to not touch it. They're going to deny the emergency application, even if they agree with it. Uh, I think they're just going to say, this is premature. We're going to let this play out and then we'll deal with it down the road. Nevertheless, um, <clears throat> we'll see what the California Rifle and Pistol Association does. And if they file their petition, uh, you know, we'll report on that and talk about what happens with it and what the Supreme Court does with it and what the other side says, if anything, in response to it in front of the Supreme Court. All right, folks, hope you learned a little bit of something here today. If you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner, please do so. Don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner, and we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.